Good evening. On behalf of the Newark Public Library, welcome to tonight's program, Inventing Film, a book talk by Gordon Bond. I'm Tom Ankner, director of the Charles F. Cummings New Jersey Information Center at the library. Uh, we are excited to be hosting local author and historian Gordon Bond tonight. We ask that everyone keep their cameras and microphones off during his presentation. Please type any questions or comments in the chat box. Gordon will get to as many as possible after his talk. Gordon Bond is an independent historian, author, and lecturer. He is the founder and e-publisher of GardenStateLegacy.com, a website dedicated to New Jersey history. He is the author of six books focusing on aspects of New Jersey history. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, New Jersey history, and has written a large number of articles and reviews for Garden State Legacy. He is currently working on a new book about the Reverend Hannibal Goodwin and his invention of roll photographic film in Newark, New Jersey. Gordon also has a freelance graphic design business, Gordon Bond Design. He has designed and guest curated exhibits for the Middlesex County Office of Arts and History, the Abraham Stotts House in South Boundbrook, and the Historical Association of Woodbridge Township. Gordon, a New Jersey native, lives in the historic Forest Hill neighborhood of Newark with his wife and cat. Now, here is Gordon Bond. Gordon. Thank you very much, Tom. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us tonight. Um, I am actually broadcasting this from Washington State because of some family uh, emergency issues. So I just want to give a quick shout out to Aaron for getting me the files for this talk and also uh, Beth and Rob for allowing me to use their Wi-Fi. Um, so as Tom mentioned, I am working on a book about the Reverend Hannibal Goodwin. And this talk is going to be basically uh, an overview of what I have learned so far and to kind of try and give you a, an idea of who this guy was beyond just in the, the invention of film, which is what he is, of course, best known for. Um, so this isn't, you know, th there's going to be some unanswered questions and things like that. Uh, so, you know, hopefully when the book comes out, you can learn the rest of the story through that. Um, I'm going to begin by reading a quote, and this is from the Trenton Evening Times newspaper for September the 7th, 1913. In the roof of the little stone rectory of the House of Prayer on State Street in Newark, one sees as the Lackawanna train steams into the station a skylight. The skylight was tacked in by Reverend Hannibal Goodwin, a remarkable man in whom were combined the qualities of shepherd and scientist. Whoever has slung a Kodak over his shoulder and whoever has pondered the miracle of the movies may well cast a thoughtful eye upon the skylight. So when they're talking about the Lackawanna train steaming into the station, this is the station that they are referring to. And this station still exists today. It uh, will be known to, uh, to, to Newark residents as uh, New Jersey Transit's Newark Broad Street train station. And if you go up onto the platform and you know where to look, you can find that same skylight that this article is referring to. Now, this is in the back roof of this building. This is the Plume House. This is quite a historic structure. Uh, it serves as, or it was serving as the rectory of the Episcopal House of Prayer, which you see to the right there. Now, this is a uh, postcard of what it looked like back in the day. This is uh, probably early 1900s. And as you can see, it's already considered a historic structure over 200 years old, George Washington's headquarters, and so on. Uh, this is so it was built at least by 1725. Some people say as early as 1710, though that is a uh, bone of contention among Newark historians. It is the second oldest house in Newark, it's a surviving uh, house in Newark. Um, in 1849, it was sold to the neighboring Episcopal House of Prayer, and they made it their rectory the following year. So this is what it would have looked like when Hannibal Goodwin would have occupied it. Now, uh, so who was Hannibal Goodwin and why should we care about his home improvement project? Well, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the story I'm going to, to, to tell you here. So 
Hannibal Williston Goodwin was born on a New York State farm April the 21st, 1823. He was the first of four children that were born to George Goodwin and Cynthia Williston. He grew up in Ulysses, New York on Goodwin's Point near the shores of Cayuga Lake. This is one of New York State's famed Finger Lakes. And you can see uh, that red circle there roughly where uh, Goodwin's Point was. And um, as he approached adulthood and was starting to uh, trying to consider what he was going to do with his life, uh, he seems to have been a man that was truly in search of a path, in search of what his life was going to look like. And one of the first inclinations was to go into the law. And we know this because he applies to and, and is accepted to Yale Law School in 1843. Now, subsequent historians make a big deal out of this, that he went to Yale. The reality though, if you actually look at the records is that he did not even, I don't even think he lasted a year there. Uh, he must have decided that the law simply was not for him. I think the Yale name took on a prominence in you know, an importance for subsequent historians, subsequent biographers, and so it takes this this oversized uh, this oversized importance in his story. And before uh, the year is out, he ends up at Wesleyan University in 1844. Now, uh, Wesleyan is a, this is in Middletown, Connecticut. It's a Methodist school. It's named after Methodism's founder, John Wesley. He enters in 1844 and he leaves by his sophomore year. So again, he's, he's searching. He's trying to figure out what it is he wants to do in life. And this is reflected in his school activities. Uh, he leaves after sophomore year and ends up at Union College. This is in Schenectady, New York. And at the time, this was the largest liberal arts college in the country. And this is where he first encounters the science of chemistry. And that's going to become really important later in his life. Uh, this is something that fascinates him. It becomes a hobby for him, something that, that, that is always kind of in the back of his mind, even as, he's, as he is going on to other things in his life and in his career. Chemistry is always kind of uh, a parallel to this story. He also, is a, he also joins fraternities and literary clubs. And there is a sense, and this is, becomes a theme throughout his life, uh, he likes the, he seems to like the idea of being the erudite intellectual. He likes that image. He likes that, 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 that concept for himself and that, that self-actualization of being an intellectual. Uh, and again, you're, we're going to see this uh, throughout his, his life. Now he does graduate. This is the first school he graduates from with a master of arts in 1843. Now, at some point he also decides his future is going to be in theology and he ends enters Union Theological Seminary in 1849. Now, this is not to be confused with the, the Union College we just talked about. Uh, there are two separate uh, entities. This one is in Manhattan, founded in 1836. It's a non-denominational seminary. And by then it was considered to be sort of a center of liberal Christian thought in America. And I'm using liberal here, not in a political sense, but more in, reflective of the, the, how in this, this first half of the, the 19th century, you have the emergence of, of sciences and engineering, and uh, there's a lot of social changes going on during this period. And religions, various relig religious institutions, various faiths are trying to come to grips with this changing and increasingly in many ways secular American society. Uh, some are becoming liberal in the sense that they are reforming, uh, or they're more reformist, they're looking for different interpretations of lit liturgy, uh, trying to adapt to remain relevant to the changing times. Uh, this evidently did not appeal to Goodwin, and we see this again later in, in his, in his uh, career, because he leaves the Union Theological Seminary in 1849 after just one year, and he ends up instead at General Theological Seminary, and he graduates in 1851. Now, this is an Episcopalian uh, seminary. This is really where I think he, he finally finds his, uh, his place in life, the path that he wants to take. This is, um, he was going to devote himself to, to Episcopalianism. And one of the, the things that, that 
some uh, later biographers attribute this to is a visit to this. This is, this is Trinity Church in Lower Manhattan. Uh, it, the, the, the current incarnation that, that it's, it's still standing there, uh, still standing today, this was built in 1846. So it was still a relatively new building by the time that Goodwin would have been in the area. Uh, at the time, it was also the tallest building in the United States. So it was an impressive structure uh, just on its own. Um, there is also a, uh, it's also a, a great expression of high church Episcopalism. Now, I'm not going to necessarily get into a lot of the details of this, obviously, but suffice to say that, uh, I mean, there are substantive uh, liturgical differences between high church, low church, as well as um, you know, the structure of the church and the role of the church in, 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 in everyday life and so on. The, the most visible manifestation of this, however, is in churches like this, the, 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 um, the aesthetic that they give off. High church is more, has more in common with Ang the Anglicanism that Episcopalism comes from. They have, they, they like more Gothic churches. They like uh, a lot of stained glass. Their ceremonies are more elaborate. They like more can use of candles and so on. The, vest the vestments are more uh, ornate and, and, and so forth. Um, more traditional, more conservative in a sense. Uh, this is what appeals, I think, to Hannibal Goodwin. The other side, the, 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 the high church is oftentimes equated with being more Catholic in, 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 its, in the expression of its faith. Low church, what's called low church, tends to be simpler. Uh, it's not quite as in line with the Anglicanism that it came from. Uh, they prefer simpler architecture. They like plain glass windows as opposed to stained glass. The, vet, the ceremonies are a lot simpler and so on. So what we see here, because Hannibal Goodwin aligns himself with the high church theology, is very in keeping with what we know about him as a person. There is a, an elitism to it, and I don't mean that in a pejorative sense. I, this tends to be the faith uh, of the upper class, the wealthy, people in positions of power, into intellectuals. So again, we see that concept of intellectualism and, and uh, that, that seems to have attracted Goodwin as early as his Union College days, manifesting itself in the form of Episcopalianism that he, um, he comes into. So he graduates from the seminary and his first church, so in, 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 in this form of Episcopalism, uh, the individual churches send out an invitation. They let them know that, they let the bishop know that they're in need of a, uh, of a clergyman. The bishop sends them a list of available clergy. They vote on it. So it's a very democratic way of doing things, which is something, again, that differentiated from the Anglicanism, especially after the American Revolution. So he ends up at Christ Church in Bordentown, New Jersey. He's there from 1852 to 1854. One of the really cool things that I found that I don't know how many people knew about him uh, comes from a, uh, th th this, is, this is an entry from the Vestry Minutes. Uh, I have a transcript here. This is from uh, January the 17th, 1854. The rector made a statement relative to his connection with the agitation in regard to the public school now prevailing in the vicinity, he being at present the superintendent of said school. This is a really interesting thing. He, he, there's no record of what that statement was, but it can only refer to one thing because the only public school in New Jersey at that time was the one that had been established at Bordentown by Clara Barton. So she had been in education. Uh, the, the concept of public schools had been very controversial. People in the town didn't necessarily, they weren't necessarily on board with the idea. They didn't like the idea of, uh, you know, paying for other people's education and so forth and so on. She comes in, she sets up the school and it becomes a success. By the end of the year, she's won over a lot of converts. Not that she has all kinds of students, but well, at that time it was mostly male students. Uh, but the, the parents are all on board with this idea, they like it. And so the, the concept of public schools becomes established thanks to her and this first school. It becomes so popular that by the end of it, the, 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 the town decides that they're going to build for her a permanent 
school, a permanent school house, a permanent building. Um, the question though becomes who is going to be the principal of this school, the administrator of the school. Now, there's one segment of the population that is saying, well, why not give it to Clara Barton? I mean, she created this thing. Nobody knows this, this, this concept or the, the, the school better than she does. But there's another, another side that's saying this isn't a proper role for a woman. You can be a teacher, but you can't be a principal. You can't be an administrator. Um, and they want to bring in a man to be the principal of the school, not only a man, but a man from outside of the community, somebody from outside of Bordentown, which did not sit well with the other faction, obviously. Uh, so this was the controversy that was going on in 1854 that Goodwin was apparently involved with. I have been unable to find any evidence one way or the other which side of this controversy he was he falls on but they're talking about him as being the superintendent of the school so obviously he was part of this and he felt it necessary to make a statement to the vestry so there must have been some kind of controversy going on here um the side that wanted to bring in the outside man as the principal they won out uh Clara Barton decides she's going to leave. She actually gets out of teaching altogether. And um, of course, Bordentown's loss becomes America's gain because she goes on to create the American Red Cross, which of course is a huge accomplishment. Uh, but it's interesting because not long after Clara Barton leaves Bordentown in 1854, so does Hannibal Goodwin. So it seems like he may have been in conflict with his the views of his parish on this school and on this issue. But again, I have not been able to find evidence one way or the other. The newspapers of the period uh, don't go back far enough. They're surviving newspapers, local papers don't go back far enough. None of the biographies of Clara Barton mention Goodwin. So I don't know, this, this remains a mystery that I am still working on. But I think it's pretty cool, this idea that Goodwin knew and probably worked with Clara Barton. So he leaves. Let's see, is this going to advance? There we go. So he leaves uh, in 1854 and he ends up in Newark, New Jersey at St. Paul's. I call this his first Newark period because he's going to leave and come back again. So he's here between 1854 and eight, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, 1854 and 1858. And then he, he gets another invitation to go to a newly established high church uh, called Trinity Church in Trenton, New Jersey. And there's a whole, there's a lot of, con, a lot of uh, controversy that's going on in the Trenton uh, Episcopalian community at this time that results in a, the splitting off of this high, new high church uh, parish. And, you know, so I mean, I'm not gonna go into the details of it here. It will be for the book, but, uh, it's kind of anticlimactic because Hannibal Goodwin only lasts eight, 11 months in this position in 18, just in 1859. The reason why he doesn't last long is because he's starting to have health issues. And this is something that would plague him for the rest of his life. It's described as a bronchial complaint, so it must be some uh, uh, upper respiratory issue that he, he is having. So his doctors apparently tell him that he needs to find a dry, hot climate, which back then would have meant someplace like California. So he actually goes clear across the country to California, although more accurately, he goes around to California because this was before there was the Transcontinental Railroad. He and his family would have gotten on a ship in, uh, out of New York, it would have gone down to Panama, there was no canal yet, so there would have been an overland part of his journey. They would have picked up another steamship that would have gone around to San Francisco. Uh, he serves in uh, a couple different uh, parishes out here. Let me just grab my notes here. So uh, he's mostly up in the Napa Valley, uh, Sacramento area. Um, so he, uh, he serves at Christ Church in Napa, as well as St. John's in Marysville. Now these are kind of uh, frontier communities and these parishes, uh, they, they don't, they can't, uh, they don't have enough resources to hire a permanent clergy. So he would have been bouncing back and forth between them. 
uh, sharing his time between these two these two uh, communities. One thing I, I just as a, as an interesting side note here, St. John's in Marysville, uh, Mary the town of Marysville is named after Mary Murphy Covalon. I think I pronounced it that correct. Uh, the, the, the town was founded by her husband, Charles Julian Kovalod. And what's, what's interesting is they were both survivors of the ill-fated Donner Party of 1846-47. So not only did, did Hannibal Goodwin know, probably know Clara Barton, but he would have known survivors of the, the infamous Donner Party. The, so this he was he was bouncing back and forth mostly between 18, around 1859-1862, that period. He would go on to serve primarily, however, in San Francisco. In 18, he arrived there in 1862. Now this is this this is a, a panoramic view, the beautiful illustration. You can find it on the Library of Congress uh, website. I'm just kind of focusing on this one point, but this is in 1862. So this would have been San Francisco as the Goodwins would have known it, and they do highlight the church that he ended up at, Grace Church in San Francisco between 1862 and 1867. Now, what's kind of funny is that the newspapers are reporting that he went from Newark to San Francisco for his health. The newspapers in 1867 are saying that he's going back to Newark for his health. So I don't know exactly what's going on there, but uh, obviously uh, he was still having some kind of health issues. Uh, he ends up going back to Newark, New Jersey. This is his second Newark period. This is where he is finally at the House of Prayer in Newark. And he's gonna be there for the next 20 years of his life, 1867, 1887. Um, till he retires. And this is where he kind of establishes himself. He becomes settled in is a high church clergy in a well-off ep urban Episcopal church or Episcopal parish. Um, as he starts getting closer to retirement, what we see is that that chemistry that he discovers in Union College becomes increasingly part of his life. They, he becomes, uh, it, it, it's a hobby that it starts to encroach more and more increasingly onto this other aspect of his life. Later on, he would remember that, quote, as a young man, I was a lover of chemistry. I enjoyed chemical reactions. Their beauty appealed to me. I was engrossed in the subject and devoted as much time to it as I could spare from my life work to ministry. Uh, this is this is true, but it, as he was approaching retirement, we see this becoming increasingly less of a hobby and more of a potential second act to his life. Because not only is he uh, doing these experiments up in that attic in in, in the Plume House, uh, but he is also doing things like applying for patents. So. Uh, so it's like the, the, the 1880s, the, 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 the tenure between like 1880, 1887, uh, this is where he, he's really starting to get more, I think, serious looking to monetize his hobby, turning this into something he can make, make money from. Um, his primary focus was on the overlap between chemistry and printing. And he was involved with uh, photo engraving. And Quickly, what that is, is you take a metal plate, you coat it with a chemical, and this is where his, his inventions come into play. Uh, you put a negative on it, you expose it to light, you take that plate and you bathe it, bathe it in an in, in acid. And what the chemical does, it interacts with the light in such a way that certain parts, the parts that maybe were blocked by the negative, uh, remain impervious to the acid. Whereas the parts where the light were interacted with the light become are, are still a, a soluble in acid, so it creates the up the the, the raised and lowered part, uh, parts to the metal plate that you need in order to turn it into a metal printing plate. Uh, for a brief period of time, he had a company called the Hagotype Company, H A G O Type, and it comes from the first two letters of his first and last name, Hannibal H A Goodwin G O. So the Hagotype Company. Uh, which he runs in, which is is operated in Manhattan with a, uh, a business partner. It does not take off, but you can see that he is trying to monetize these inventions. He's trying to turn this into something that he can he can make a living from. Um, the the so the, the the patent that is on the left there that was for one of the these uh, uh, printing uh, the, the the chemistry how to use the chemistry to create printing plates. The one on the left is kind of interesting because 
This is later on when he's experimenting with celluloid. And what he realized is that you could make essentially plastic toothpaste tubes. So tubes were, metal tubes were being used for, for toothpaste, for, uh, for paints, for ointments, for anything of that viscosity, but they were made out of metal. So it was tin, it was zinc, it was even lead, where it was soft enough, you could, you could, you know, it was malleable enough, you could uh, push it to, squeeze it in order to get the contents out. Problem was it, it's metal, it's solid, you can't see what's inside it. His thought is if you could take the celluloid, you can make celluloid clear or, or semi-transparent so that you can see how much is left in it, the contents of it, and so on. It doesn't tarnish and all those types of things. This doesn't seem to have caught on because we really don't see plastic tubes being commercially used in this way until probably the, maybe the 1980s. Uh, but you can see he's trying all these different things, all these different ideas, trying to get patents, looking for the, the next big thing. So the next big thing actually becomes something involving photography. And I call this section the desiratum, that which is desired, because this becomes, this is kind of becomes the holy grail in the world of photography. Now, obviously I don't have enough time to go into a history of photography, but suffice to say that at this point, uh, you had, Initially, you had metal plates. So you take a metal plate, you coat it with a photosensitive emulsion, you put it in your camera, you expose it, you, you develop it, you fix it, and what you get is what's called a direct positive. So it is a positive image on this formed onto this metal plate. It is essentially a one-off thing. You get this one photograph, and that is it. You can't make copies of it. I guess technically you could take a picture of a picture, but it's it, the quality is, go, is going to suffer and so on. So it's a, it's a one-off process. You get that one picture. Okay, that's fine. Somebody realized that you could do the same thing, but on a glass plate, a clear black glass plate. And if you do it with a photo emulsion that creates a negative, you can make uh, positive prints. You can make multiple positive prints, theoretically an unlimited number of positive prints. So we think of this idea, uh, I, I call this talk in part about you know, the democratization of photography. We think about this idea of wanting to be able to take pictures on the fly, so to speak, and sharing them. And of course, obviously the digital revolution makes that for better or worse, makes that very easy to do. Everybody has a, ca has a camera in their pocket and you can share it on social media and so on. But that idea, that impetus, that desire to do this thing predates all of this stuff. It goes back into the, into the 1880s. But there are certain problems in, caused by these plates, glass plates, that kind of keeps it out of the hands of the average person, that democratization part. So this is a camera, you know, you've probably seen pictures uh, similar to this. Those uh, containers to the right there, those wood boxes, those are carriers, those are slide carriers. Uh, you would, if you were a photographer, you would get a box of glass plates. Now, originally you had to sensitize those plates yourself and use them within a certain length of time. Big advance was when they came up with the dry plate photography. So that was the, the, the plates came pre-coded in a box. You had to take them in, you still had to take them into a dark room, take them out and put them into these carriers. The carrier would then be put into the, into the back of the camera. There'd be a slide that would lift up to so that you could expose it. You would have to close it, remove it. And then in a dark room, remove the actual glass plate out of the carrier and do the processing. So you're still talking about a rather cumbersome process of swapping out between, for swapping out plates, doing the developing, loading the carriers, and all the sorts of things. This made it expensive, it made it cumbersome. It was not something the average person necessarily was going to bother doing. Photography was still the realm of the professional or the wealthy amateur. The movement of photography was towards trying to make this accessible to more people, because if you could do that, you, it would open up a whole new market for selling cameras and photographic equipment and, and so on. So you see cameras getting increasingly smaller. This is a camera out of my collection. You can see by the quarter there how small we're getting, but you still need the carrier. You still need something to put a glass plate into, and you still have that, that process. The other problem with glass plates is they are rather heavy. Um, this is a collection of glass plates that I found at a uh, antique store in Somerville, New Jersey. 
they're all pre-exposed, but the, the, this, I don't know who owned these. I don't know who these people are, but they're, they're pre-exposed. This is what it looks like. It's a negative image, as you can see. So you could make positive uh, prints from it. Somebody cut out an oval shaped mask so that the, the image would be oval. This is what it looks like in positive, very happy looking family, as you can see. Um, but the point is that this box of plates, and it's not, it, you know, it's, it's maybe that big, uh, weighs over a pound. So if you are a photographer and you want to, let's say, take pictures outside of the studio, uh, even though the cameras are small, you still have to deal with carry, lugging around these, ex, these glass plates. Then you have to put the glass plates into the carriers. The carriers add weight to it. Uh, glass plates are also, they're glass. So that means they're also fragile. They can crack, they can break. If you drop them, you chip the edges and so on. So there's really three drawbacks to glass. It's heavy, it's subject to breakage, and it's, it, it creates complications swapping out between exposures. Now, part of how this, um, uh, people are starting to think about how to resolve these problems, it began to change with this gentleman. This is John Wesley Hyatt. And the reason why the eight ball rolled in there is because he was, he was a chemist and he was on the hunt for a synthetic replacement for ivory in billiard balls. And so he creates this material called celluloid. And he's, he's making these balls, which are traditionally made out of ivory, which was expensive and difficult to obtain. Billiards were becoming increasingly popular. Uh, you know, pool halls were becoming increasingly popular in America. So if he could make something cheap and easy and, uh, you know, uh, without all, all the complications of the ivory, then certainly that would be a big business for him. He starts out making these things in New York, New York State ends up moving a fa his factory into Newark, but he begins to recognize that he could do more with it than just make billiard balls. So today we think of, we recognize that there's a lot of problems with plastic, whether it's environmental issues or health issues, um, but at the time it must've seemed like a truly miraculous material because you could melt it, mold it into pretty much anything, any shape you wanted to, you could color it and so forth. What Wesley Hyatt, which I Wesley Hyatt realized is the mo real money was to be made in supplying the raw material to other people who were making all manner of things out of celluloid. Uh, buttons, so it collars, dolls, Christmas ornaments, what, whatever you could think of, if you could build the mold and, and so on, you could probably use this, his plastic for it. And one of the other ideas that people had, and certainly he had, oh, so I, I should point out that he, he uh, his um, celluloid company in Newark was a, made Newark basically the center, the, the celluloid capital of the world for a while there. And this would have been going on when Goodwin was, was in Newark. He knew John Wesley Hyatt um, personally. So this would have been in the industrial zeitgeist of Newark during the, the 1880s. Um, but one of the other areas that, that they went into, they looked into was into photography. What if you could take a block of clear celluloid, shave off a nice thin sheet, you could use that in place of glass as a glass substitute. And you know this worked to some extent because it was lighter. So it took out that objection to glass. It was uh, flexible so that it wouldn't break if you dropped it but you, it was still a plate. You, you really couldn't bend it too far. I mean, you could bend it and it wouldn't break, but you couldn't roll it or anything yet. So um, that, the, the, you still had to have the carriers and doing all those sorts of things. So it, it solved two of the three objections to glass. There were other issues why it didn't quite catch on. Uh, I mean, a lot of photographers were going into this area, including uh, guys like John, uh, uh, Talbot, or I'm sorry, uh, Carbot, um, who were trying to 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 get this as the next big thing in photography and make money from it. But the problem was, uh, it was hard to get a perfectly flat surface, or there were blemishes. But also, just getting the emulsion to adhere to the celluloid was problematic, and it never quite caught on. Uh, but you can see this is kind of where the direction where the where the industry was going. But what was, rec what was recognized is if you could take this celluloid, if you could take some kind of plastic, clear plastic, 
make it really, really thin. You could make it thin enough that you could put it onto a spool. You could roll it onto itself. If you could put them onto spools, you could put them into the camera. This would eliminate the third objection to glass because now it would make uh, the, the, the switching between exposures much, much easier. Here, take a picture, turn a crank, and you're ready to go again. You don't have to fuss with all these, you know, the, the carriers and the plates and the extra weight and all. It's all contained within your camera. And what was, so, you know, you're, you're all set up and you can just keep going and going and going. But what was recognized is that you've kind of reversed the process, put a light down there. You know, this is this, you see the beginnings of modern cinema. You could you could create the movies. So when that article talks about you know uh, if you you marvel at the miracle of the movies, this is the kind of thing they're talking about. Now, needless to say, a lot of people were working on finding a solution to the desiratum, including this gentleman. This is George Eastman, uh, name which will be familiar, I'm sure, to most of you. Uh, he starts out making a dry plate. This is the, the glass plates that are in the box. To, again, you can see there it says to be, uh, to be opened only in photographic darkroom, but he's getting into, into the market. He understands though, that if he can, if he can make the film, uh, a rollable film, that this is gonna be a big deal. And he kind of starts off with the most obvious material, uh, paper that can be rolled. And he goes so far as patenting an invention with uh, William H. Walker for a, uh, a, a sort of a cartridge, a roller cartridge that makes use of this paper film. And what was especially important about this invention was that it was built in a way that you could put it into the back of an existing camera where you would normally have the hard, the, the, the plate the, uh, uh, carrier. You could just put this back into your camera. So you didn't have to buy a whole new camera. So that was an obvious advantage. The issue though was with the technology. You could take a strip of paper, you could coat it with the, the photographic emulsion. The quality just wasn't as good as with glass the tonal range wasn't quite as good as with glass. Um, the, sometimes there'd be graining from the paper, texture from the paper and so on. He was trying to market this to professional photographers, to the existing photographic market. And, you know, they're looking at this and saying, well, it's neat, you know, it's a, it's a clever idea, but the quality just isn't as good. So we're not on board with this yet. So being probably a better marketing guy than he was a chemist, Eastman decides he's going to go into the opposite direction. Instead of marketing this to professionals who have a higher uh, expectation of quality, he's gonna market this to the masses where that level of expect expectations are a little bit lower. If he can make a camera that is cheap enough where he can put this roll film inside of it, um, the average person is going to be interested in this. Rather than the professional, it's going to be the, the, the quote unquote masses. This is the birth of the Kodak camera. This is a very simple device, very cheap lens. There's not even a viewfinder. You just kind of point it in the direction, pull one thing, click another thing, and turn the crank. Um, but it's it's a revolutionary idea because you don't have to, it's small, you don't have to deal with the with the plates and all that kind of thing. And it didn't make bad pictures. I mean, you can look on the internet. There, are, there's tons of examples of them out there. I just, you know, picked this one at random. And you know, a professional would look at this and lament the lack of tonal range, for example, or the lack of clarity, or some of the texturing, or so on that comes from the paper. Uh, but for the average person who could never have taken a picture before, this was amazing. I can I can take this little box and take pictures for myself. I don't have to go to a professional photographer. I can do this on my own. That was a, a major step in that democratization concept for photography. Uh, I should point out that the reason why this image is circular, they were using cheap lenses to keep the, the price down, which but that introduced um, uh, distortion around the edges in the corners. So if they printed them round, 
you wouldn't notice those uh, those distortions. But this was this was still a major advance. So this was the, the Kodak camera, the, the origin of you probably you probably have heard this this the slogan before. You press the button, we do the rest, and they meant it for for twenty five dollars, which wasn't cheap, but it was certainly you couldn't get a, a higher end. You can get other cameras this cheaply, so it was becoming increasingly in, in within the, the the price range of the average person. You would get a camera that came preloaded with its with the film for one hundred pictures. You know, we think of uh, those of us who are old enough to remember uh, uh, loading, you know, film. You get 12, 24 exposures. You could get a hundred exposures from this camera. What you would do is after you took your pictures, you would send the whole camera back to Kodak. They would develop it, they would send you back your pictures, and they would send you another camera with another 100 exposures. So it, whatever it lacked in quality, it made up for in convenience and accessibility for people who were not, it had no interest in becoming professional photographers. Again, democratization of photography. But as much as this was an advance, it was a step forward, it was also a step back because these were paper images. These were direct positive images, again, not a whole lot different than the metal plates, the daguerreotypes, the tin types, and, and, and that, that, that first generation of photography. Step forward, but also step back. The last piece to the puzzle was a clear photographic film that you could make copies from. They could make a negative and make copies from. Again, that urge, that desire to share your pictures that you see every day on Instagram and, photo and, and Facebook and everything, every place else. You know, this, this, this is nothing new. This is nothing new to the digital age. This goes back to the 1880s, early 1900s. So the invention, this is where Goodwin comes back in. So um, Goodwin, he was, he was well, he was known for his, um, for having a very fatherly love of children. He and his wife, I, there's evidence that they fostered children. They did not have biological children of their own, but they adopted children. I think they were fostering them. Uh, he also took a very active role in their education and the parochial schools that were part of his, the par different parishes that he uh, uh, was part of. And he would have, he would organize classes and teach classes and he wouldn't charge the parents anything extra to do it. So he was obviously doing this because he enjoyed it. And one of the things that he would do in order to uh, illustrate his lectures, these were all, you know, Sunday school biblical lectures, he would use a magic lantern, a magic, magic, essentially a slide, early slide projector using glass slides. And he found that the slides that were available commercially didn't quite meet his needs, so he made his own. So this meant taking pictures, in, taking photographs out of books uh, on a glass, on a piece of, of glass that he could then hand tint and so forth and create these, these, these slides with which he could illustrate his lectures. And they were very popular. Now, he was also a photographer, amateur photographer, so he was very well aware of, of the, the limitations and the problems with glass. And not only because of just the weight of carrying these things around, if he was going to do his lectures elsewhere, but children who would help him, you know, invariably, eventually, you know, this would slip out of their hands and all of his hard work would end up smashed on the floor. So there was the weight issue, there was the, the fragility issue. So he was very well aware of all these things that were going on. And he decided he was going to see if he could make a clear plastic uh, substrate that could be used to make these slides. And that got him interested in, well, maybe I can also solve the question of flexible roll film, the desire atom. This is when he built, this is when he has his uh, laboratory up in the attic of the plume house. This is where he puts in that skylight and he begins working on this problem. And there was something uh, obsessive about his approach to this. Um, when you read even his own descriptions, uh, there, there, you know, he, he was working long hours, long into the night. There are stories about how his wife would come up uh, to let him know dinner was, was ready. He'd be working long into the night and, you know, yeah, okay, I'll be down in a minute. And he wouldn't come down because he would go back to his work and they would be eating dinner alone. Um, 
there is a, 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 an account, this comes from Jay Weisner Thorne, who was a, a newspaper publisher in Newark and one of his uh, parishioners. And he described later on, quote, as he stood there with his hands on the book, you could see the chemical stains if you sat up front. And you couldn't help but notice them on communion Sunday when he passed the cup. The people of the town believed he was impairing his mind with his useless research. Well, he would, in a sense, have the last laugh uh, because he did come up with something that worked. So what did he invent? Well, the logical starting point would have been celluloid. As we saw, you know, John Wesley Hyatt, Newark is the, the celluloid capital of the world. Photographers are experimenting with celluloid. Uh, so this was, this was a, a, an obvious place to start. Now, celluloid is made up of primarily two components, nitrocellulose and camphor. Um, camphor can be problematic because it, it is what they call sweat out when you're trying to make this film. It, it creates a greasy surface. You can't get the photographic emulsion to adhere, to bond to it properly. Sometimes it, it's cloudy and so on. So he concentrates on nitrocellulose alone, kind of taking the camphor out of the equation. The nitrocellulose is kind of an odd place to start. It is also known as gun cotton because it's highly, highly flammable. Now I found this video, I'm gonna play it for you. Small bit of nitrocellulose gun cotton, small flame, Whoops, sorry. Watch what happens. Boom. Here it is on slow motion. So when you hear about old movies, the nitro, you know, uh, nitrocellulose film and how it's disintegrating and eating itself alive, well, this is why, because this is the foundation of what those early films were made out of. Nevertheless, he experiments with it. He determines that if he mixes it, boils it with a solution of alcohol and benzene, he can create a solution that can be poured out over a flat surface like a piece of glass or a glass tray that is perfectly flat, lets it dry, it seeks its own level, becomes flat, lets it dry. Once it's dry, you can peel it off and you get this film, this flexible film that you can now coat with a photographic emulsion and if you can make it in strips, you can roll it up and this is photographic film. Now, this is a highly uh, oversimplified explanation of what he did. Obviously, a lot of people, a lot of smarter people even were working on this problem and couldn't solve it. But the thing is, it has to, the, the product had to have certain uh, characteristics. It had to be perfectly transparent. Any blemishes, any haze, anything that interfered with the image was no good. Had to be flexible yet strong. Had to be flexible enough to be rolled up into a, into a tight spool, yet strong enough that it would break when you were cracking it through the camera. It had to be impervious to all these chemicals, to the, to, to, to the photographic emulsion you're putting onto it, but also to the chemicals that you're using in order to develop and fix it. Um, if it failed in any one of these characteristics, the whole thing would be a failure. And that's why it was so difficult. You had to juggling all these different parameters to try and find just the right uh, uh, set of ingredients to achieve this goal. The interference. So obviously Goodwin knew what he had here and he knew he had to get it patented. And he did file for his patent in uh, 1887. Uh, the problem is that it took him a while to actually have the patent granted. I am in the process right now there. So his uh, uh, patent lawyer, his name was Charles Pell and Charles Pell in Newark. And I'm going through his papers at the uh, New Jersey Historical Society in Newark. So shout out to them. Um, I'm going through them right now uh, in order to kind of piece together the exact sequence of events. And what seems to be going on is Goodwin, he's not, I mean, he would pick everybody's brain. He would talk to people like John Wesley Hyatt and anybody who he could talk to about the chemistry and these processes and so on, but he wasn't a professional chemist. The language that he used is, he was trying to kind of cast a wide net in terms of what he was claiming to patent. Um, there were certain issues with recommendations from the patent office and so on. It took him like 11 years in or before he got this patent. Uh, in the meantime, this gentleman, Henry M. Reichenbach, he was a chemist with Kodak. He gets a patent for something very similar, if not exactly similar, um, or exactly the same. 
Uh, there's different stories as to there may have been some industrial espionage kind of things going on here, which I'm still trying to, to parse out. There was uh, a, ke a chemical supplier who, uh, who was a supplier both to Goodwin and to Reich and to, to Kodak, um, who may have clued Kodak in, George Eastman into what, was, what Goodwin was up to. And so certainly the Goodwin family believed that this person betrayed them. Uh, I, do, I don't know if that's entirely true. I have names I'm not going to give yet just because I'm in, I'm in touch with, their, with his relatives. I don't want to say anything until I know I'm sure, much more sure of my facts, but that's a really interesting aspect of the story that I'm still working on and hopefully I'm going to get to the bottom of, and that will of course be part of the, the book eventually. Uh, but just to give you an idea of what we're talking about here. So Goodwin files his patent May 2nd, 1887. It's finally granted to se September the 13th, 1898. All right. So this is a long time, a lot of revisions, a lot of back and forth. Part of it is Goodwin doesn't have enough money to, to do it, doesn't have the resources, doesn't have the time. He's in the process of retiring. He, there's thing, other things going on with the church at this time, distractions and, and whatnot. So by contrast, the Kodak patent filed November 8th, 1890, gets granted September 1st, 1891. So very quick, probably because they knew better how to, their lawyers knew better how to uh, write a patent. Now, ultimately there is a, uh, an infringement suit. We're gonna talk about that momentarily that doesn't get settled uh, in Goodwin's, Goodwin's favor until March 10th, 1914. So this process takes 27 years from the time that Goodwin filed his patent, 16 years after it was granted. So this is a long legal slog that he and his heirs are going to be involved in. Now in the meantime, on June 16th, 1898, along with uh, uh, Charles Pell as, uh, and Cortland Parker and some other people, he, find, he founds the Goodwin Film and Camera Company with the idea of capitalizing on this patent. Once he gets his patent, he wants to start manufacturing it. And there's a little bit of controversy or a little bit of disagreement among the, the, the partners as to whether they're going to create a factory, they're going to build a factory in Newark and start manufacturing this themselves, or they're going to partner with somebody who's already established, maybe someone who is a, uh, in competition with Kodak, and they're going to start making film as well. But the problem is Kodak is making, has been making film all along using a patent, using it that is, Goodwin feels is his idea. Um, Goodwin finds out that, that Kodak at this point is making 60,000 spools each week of their film. Up to the, up to the point where he, he, he inquires, they had made 1.5 million spools of film. So if they are in violation of Goodwin's patent, and he can prove that in court and he can win that, there is a lot of money potentially that he's gonna get just out of the lawsuit alone, let alone um, the sale of the, the actual film. And he writes to Charles Pell in 1898, uh, when after seeing what, uh, what Kodak was doing, quote, I think I'm quite right in saying that we have a variable Klondike. Now, Unfortunately, um, Hannibal Goodwin dies on December 31st, 1900, before any of this really gets too far. Uh, he, the story is that he was uh, getting off of a streetcar in Newark on Montclair Avenue in Newark. By this point, he is retired, so the family is no longer living in the Plume House. Um, he is in his 70s. He's a physically large man, not fat necessarily, but big. And so when he loses his balance on, on a piece of loose pavement and he falls, he falls hard and he ends up breaking his leg. And he's laid up and eventually he catches pneumonia as the, the pneumonia that kills him on the last day of 1900. His widow uh, and the, the, the other partners involved in the Goodwin Film and Camera Company, uh, they sell or they, they uh, partner with and give the patent over to uh, the Anthony Scoville company, which becomes ANSCO. Some people might remember uh, ACFA ANSCO. Um, now, obviously, uh, you know, they, they need to get this resolved. They can't, they can't just keep allowing this, what they see as, a, as, as an infringement continue. It's, an, it's a, 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 a blockage to their business plan. So in 1902, 
uh, Ansco, along with Rebe Rebecca Goodwin, his widow, sues Kodak. Now, as I, you know, spoiler alert, uh, it takes a while, obviously, but finally in March of 1914, the court uh decision comes down and it is against the eastman company and this is this is a big deal at that time uh the settlement is for five million dollars in 1914 roughly 134 million dollars in today's money so this this was a big big deal uh there is an it ends up being an out-of-court settlement uh they decide not to the codec decides not to appeal it uh, they just want it to go away, and so they 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 make the settlement. Now, of course, you know by this point, Goodwin Hannibal Goodwin has been dead for 14 years. His widow Rebecca Goodwin is in her 80s. She would be dead six months after that um, after that decision. So this is an article from this is a picture from an article in one of the local newspapers where they went and they interviewed Rebecca Goodwin, asking her about you know, how she felt about becoming this millionaire because she's getting a portion of that $5 billion, becoming a millionaire, at, you know, and she doesn't really care at this point. Her husband is gone. She's too, it's too old to make any difference in her life. Maybe it'll make a difference for, for their, their children or their grandchildren. But there's a kind of pathos to the story because the people who were involved in its development, including Charles Pell and Cortland Parker early on, um, they're all dead by this point. Um, so it's kind of a sad story in that respect, but she was very happy that at the very least, her husband's name and his genius, in a sense, his inventive genius was finally vindicated and recognized. And I show this picture in particular because this is where they were living at the time. And this house still exists today. A lot of changes to it, but it is still there. Um, as is the, 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 the uh, attic at the Plume House where he conducted his experiments. And I was fortunate enough to be able to get up there and to, uh, to see this room where all this history took place. So if you ever find yourself in Newark, if you ever find yourself on, that, uh, on the Broad Street train station platform and you glance over and see this skylight in the back, in this, uh, back of this old building, you know, give, uh, give a pause, uh, give a thought to Hannibal Goodwin and the history that happened beneath that skylight. And I leave you with this quote from Hannibal himself. I felt sure that though the gods grind their mills almost hopelessly slow, they generally at last grind out a grist. And from long experience, I was confident that all things come to them that wait. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Gordon. That was terrific. It was really interesting. It was a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, and now let's have some questions. Uh, I just want to remind our viewers that um, if anyone has a question or comment about tonight's presentation, just type it in the chat box and Gordon will get to as many as possible. And we may have one already. Uh, well, we just have a few comments, just people saying wonderful talk. Thank you. Uh, delightful to hear your presentation. Uh, now we have a few questions though, okay? Um, one question I have, um, what got you interested in Hannibal Goodman? Well, being interested in uh, well, my, my, my work with uh, Garden State Legacy, um, I've just always been fascinated by history and certainly New Jersey history since this is where I'm from. And um, I, we, uh, my wife and I moved to Newark about eight years ago now. And um, I went by the Plume House many times driving her to the train station, to, to, to Broad Street train station. And um, I became aware of the history and what had, had supposedly happened there. And I was looking for just looking for another topic for a book, and I thought this kind of grabbed me. There, there's so much to this because it's there's the science, there's the legal aspects, there's the human drama aspects, this kind of David and Goliath uh, element be, uh, of Goodwin versus you know uh, versus uh, Eastman. Um, you know, there, there's just so many facets and levels to this thing. And also just getting to know him as a person beyond film. I mean, that's what he's known for. And yet this was the last, you know, a couple of years of, you know, maybe 10 years, 20 years of his life. Uh, he had a life before that. And, you know, getting to know who he was as a person, I think was also um, fascinating and um, 
kind of comparing and contrasting the personalities and finding out about the possible, you know, their feelings that someone had betrayed them and, and all those sorts of things. It, it just, it just grabbed me. It was just a fascinating story. Before I got involved with uh, the, the research, I had, I was collecting old cameras just because I liked them. And, um, George Heldke, a friend of mine, uh, now now uh, deceased, but he uh, was a docent at the Fleetwood Camera Museum in uh, was a North Mayfield, I guess. And um, he would he had written a, a short monograph about Goodwin, and uh, I remember first kind of first hearing the story from him, uh, and being fascinated by, by this idea that it it all began in, in New Jersey, having that interest in Jersey history. And then of course, once we moved to Newark and it's like, oh, okay, that's where this happened. How cool. And how many people you know, drive by this or go by in the train and have absolutely no idea that you know, this thing that for a very long time was just the norm for photography, you know, loading a roll of film, um, this is where it all started. And cinema, this is where it all began. If, you know, at least the, the basic principles of it that other people obviously took and ran with it, whether it was Kodak or Edison, but this is, this is, this is where the, the germ of the idea uh, had been planted. And I, I just found that, that fascinating. Okay. Um, Gary Sretsky asks, why did his parents name him Hannibal? A rather unusual name. <laughs> You know, I, I don't know. That is a good question. I, that he, yeah, I, I, I honestly do not know. Um, I'm trying to think. I don't remember seeing any other Hannibals in the family. Like he was named after someone. I'm not sure. They must have just liked it or maybe, I don't know. Okay. Um, the Goodwin died in 1900. Did you have any discussions with Edison? who was just not that far away, working that far away. Uh, I have not found any direct evidence of that. I did discover that he was hanging out with, um, there was an artist, McDougal, I'm drawing a blank on his first name. He was a, uh, a miniaturist who was well known for his very, very tiny, even di you know, very diminutive painting, even for that genre. And he had a studio in Newark on Broad Street. And he would do, like traditionally it would be done on the uh, ivory these little cameos that he would paint for people and um uh so he was interested in celluloid as a, as a replacement for 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 the uh for the ivory but um he had a studio and people would just pass through there are all kinds of people i mean early on this predates uh goodwin's time but you know edgar, he was friends with edgar Allan poe for example um very various people that were you know, artists and politicians and so forth so it was this kind of almost like salon informal salon type of environment and again this speaks to that idea of intellectualism and that seems to have appealed to this era erudition that seems to appeal to to have appealed to goodwin um, but among the people who would who were there were supposed to have been Edison. So, and Edison was in Newark. The, their 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 periods did overlap. Whether or not he actually spoke to him or not, or they actually had interactions, I I don't have any direct evidence of that, other than they were in the city at the same time. So it, it it's possible. I just don't have any concrete evidence. Yeah. So uh, somebody uh, that same person is asking a question that I can answer. Um, are there plans to move the Plume House? Uh, aside from the trains rumbling above, much construction going on around it, it's in disrepair, shame to see it crumbling. There are no plans to move it. I know I know that. I was involved in an effort to a few years ago uh, on preserving the house that uh, it's still owned by the um, House of Prayer Church. Uh, when they were doing the construction on the highway, not you know a few years back, there was um, there were some um, there was an effort to, modify the plans on the highway a little bit to protect the house a little better. So it's um, there, but there are no plans to move it. Uh, another comment, great presentation. Thank you. Um, so how, when did you start researching this topic? How long ago did you first start working on it? Uh, probably in earnest, probably about a year or two ago. I, I finished my, well, yeah, probably about a year because I, I finished my last book in uh, um, 2020, and um, you know this was next on my list. So probably, I mean, I, I, I since I had kind of had a peripheral interest in it, I had informally done 
research about it, but uh, in terms of actually actively going to to archives and libraries and so on, um, that was it's probably been about a year right now. Yeah. Okay. Any idea about when the book is going to come out? I'm going to say probably another year or two. Uh, part of the issue is uh there so the 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 paperwork that i'm going through the the charles pell papers here or in, in at the uh, new jersey historical society library in newark um you know that's telling one side of the story obviously it also so i mean you can kind of uh divide the 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 patent controversy period between the infringement part or between the interference part and the infringement part uh this is more the the interference part the earlier part um, I do need to get to the Eastman House Museum Library up in Rochester, New York, and because with COVID and everything, uh, obviously that's that wasn't possible. Um, so you know we're gonna I'll see what you know how things go and and in terms of uh, you know if it's safe to to do such things and uh, what they're if they're open and so on. See what I can set up. Um, Fortunately, I was able to, to have, uh, you know, specific, you know, pre-scheduled specific times to go to the library here in Newark, but it's obviously convenient for me to do that, where I'm the only person there, or me and one other person, you know, distancing and all that, but um, I would need to go up to Rochester for at least a week, uh, because I understand there are transcripts from the, the court case that concluded in 1914, the infringement part, uh, there are transcripts from that, and it's like five thousand pages. So it's going to take me a little bit of a little bit of time to get through that. So it's a matter of being able to arrange all those things to get up there and to be able to spend the time and have have, have access enough access to the materials. So you know, I, I I I've been in contact with people up there about this, and they sent me what they could, but that's really been the the main block at this point, obstacle at this point, in terms of getting the thing done. Okay. And other than the New Jersey Historical Society, what other repositories have you visited so far? Uh, or what other, been, where, what other places? Well, where, where else have you done most of your research? I mean, that, so far, that, that's been the primary one because it has a large body of papers. Um, I have been in touch with the, uh, the, the Newark uh, Museum, their library. They have some, some information, including about the gentleman who may or may not have tipped off Eastman, what Goodwin was doing, um, and again, I, I'm 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 in touch with his relatives today, and we've been going back and forth about that. And you know, they're you know they don't. I'm saying potentially bad things about their their relatives, so there's a certain sensitivity that I'm trying to observe here. But you know, the evidence is what it is, and um, I think some of that story may also be up in the transcripts up in Rochester because they would have gone over all the history of the patent process uh in in terms of trying to establish priority uh but they do have some some excellent materials including some uh, a, a picture of lincoln park in newark that is probably one of the very early neg you know roll film negatives in existence uh and the camera that it was taken with so you know so that that that's those are the, the three primary uh the the um New Jersey Historical, uh, Eastman House up in Rochester, and then the Newark uh, Museum. Um, a lot of other stuff is just online, going through the new, you know, newspaper accounts and journals, and you know, whatever I can find. You know, just mm. spending hours going through things and 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 trying to find, you know, little tidbits. Have you found examples of photographs by Goodwin? There is a picture, and unfortunately it is unattributed, but it is in the collection of uh, Charles Pell's papers at the New Jersey Historical Society of chickens in a coop somewhere, presumably in Newark. Um, I don't know if that's his or not. Um, I, I, what is, I've been trying to track down relatives of Goodwin himself. Um, uh, haven't been successful yet because he was said to have kept copious notes. He would go and he would talk to people like John Wesley Hyatt and pretty much anybody who, you know, would, would give him information. And this goes, I mean, so when he had the Hagatype company, the, the printing company in Manhattan, he was partnered with uh, Stephen Horgan, 
who is the, the father of half toning. And, and if you know anything about printing and newspaper printing, that was a, a huge deal. So he was an important person to be in touch with. Uh, but he described how whenever they would go anywhere, he would always be talking about process printing. And when he, he would he would haunt the, the the other shops and 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 you know places around Newark, around New York, wherever he could find information. And um, Corrigan said that he kept these these detailed notebooks. And I don't know where they are. I don't know if they survived. The 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 the, um, the church doesn't have them. Uh, so maybe they maybe the family had them. Maybe they were thrown away. Maybe they're in somebody's attic right now. If I could get a hold of those, those would be amazing. Um, but as of as of right now, I've not been able to um, to find them. Okay. Yeah. Well, Gordon, thank you for doing this tonight. This was this has really been terrific. It was a really interesting um, uh, presentation. And good luck with the book. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for for coming out. Okay. And thank you. And thank you to everyone who took the time to join us tonight. Good night, everyone. Be safe.